Hey everyone. If you haven't seen the other episodes of the series, I highly recommend it since we go over why we're doing all this in the first place, component selection, and casing design. Also subscribe because these are going to keep coming. But if you've forgotten, in this series I am taking on my journey to launch my first product, a heating massage pen to treat my TMJ disorder. All the way from ideas to designs, to prototypes, to production, to branding, and to sales. This episode though is all about the electronics. So here I have drawn out a simple block diagram of everything we're going to need. This seems like it's going to be a pretty standard battery powered device circuit, but it's pretty much my first time making a real PCB, so standard means low to me. We've got battery charging, a microcontroller, a switch, two push buttons, indicator LEDs, a motor driver, a heating element driver, a boost converter for the motor operating voltage, and an LDO for the MCU. I'm keeping this as simple as possible right now, and I know there are a ton of optimizations I can make. For example, as I briefly mentioned in another episode, I really think the optimal solution for power management would be to have some sort of push button latch IC that can be toggled by the MCU instead of the switch. This will let us add a bunch of safety features like shutting off power when the battery voltage gets too low, or add a thermistor and shut off the power if it gets too hot or shorts or something. Plus, a push button toggling power is just so much nicer than the switch. But once again, I'm just going to suck it up and throw it to the next version. I really just want something basic working that I can show off to people in real life. So for battery protection, I'll either just get a battery that has it on it, or just sense the voltage and blink red and prevent operation when it gets too low. I made the schematic on EZEDA with the specific components picked out and connections made. I picked the Atmega48 for the microcontroller for the cost and since we have a surprisingly high amount of GPI opens. But it's pretty much identical to the Atmega328 in terms of pinout and features so there's plenty of resources online. For driving the motor and heating element, I got the exact same setup going. I'll PWM this MOSFET, which will let me control the output voltage relative to the 7.2 volt supply here. Everything else is pretty much exactly what the datasheet says to do. Next step's the layout. Since we know the general size of the case, I decided to fit everything into something like 15 by 60 millimeters. This was super tight, and it took me a couple tries to lay everything out correctly to allow for all the wires to be routed. It's crazy how important it is to place the components in a way that matches the flow of electricity through the circuit. But since a lot of these components placement depend on UI, we don't have too much leniency with moving any of the big components like the USB port, connectors, buttons, or LEDs. So space for traces was hard to find. But I managed, and after inevitably fixing all the errors, I placed the order. While waiting for everything to arrive, I worked on getting a basic script written out to test the functionality of the board. Luckily for me, I picked a microcontroller that interfaces great with the Arduino wrapper. I found this handy at Mega48 pinout that tells me how to set the right pins in the software. It also reminded me that not every I.O. pen can PWM. And unfortunately, I didn't pick the ones that can to control the motor and heating element drivers. So the essence of the program is to track the time in milliseconds and synchronously bang on and off the motor, heater, and LED IOs, all without using delays to keep accurate timing. The duty cycle is based off of the power level counter dictated by the button presses. Now all there is to do is test it out. Luckily, we can fast forward right to when the PCB arrived. One major thing that I realized while waiting is that I totally did not think about how I'm going to program this thing. It turns out it's not as easy as just plugging into TX and RX and use serial like I'm used to, since there isn't a bootloader on these chips off the shelf. So I had to go and do a bunch of research on my options and came out with the AVR ISP programmer from Microchip. Now all I had to do was find these six ISP programming pins and solder some wires directly to them. It's unfortunate how janky these things can get on the first try. After programming the board, I instantly found some issues with the code, mainly the buttons being too sensitive, so I added some debouncing in the software. Plugging in the motor though, I found a much bigger problem. For some reason, it was running super underpowered. It seemed like the 7.2 volts that's supposed to be driving it drops down a significant amount after applying load. 
It turns out the reason for this is that I accidentally mindlessly picked out an inductor rated for 20 milliamps on the boost converter when I needed one that's gonna handle like an amp. Oops. Oh well, I wasn't expecting it to work on the first try anyway. With a new inductor picked out and the correct programming testing points placed, I brought back out a collection of components and got right into assembling and SMD soldering. Luckily, this time went a lot smoother than last, and within an hour, I had my testing board once again. This time without all the extra wires hanging off. I brought back out the programmer and gave it a spin. It works! Wait, what's wrong with this one LED? Oh, it's upside down. Whoops, let me fix that real quick. Easy, that should do it. Uh, hold on, why is this always on? No, please don't tell me I have to redesign this thing. Oh wait, it looks like the battery is directly connected to our ground. Maybe the switch has a bad connection. There we go. Phew. Okay, now it works. Look at that. That's what I call full power. Looks like the bigger inductor did the trick. I then proceeded to go a full week working on it as if I had confirmed that the PCB works. Maybe I had a gut feeling that something bad was coming something I didn't want to face head-on just yet. But that time had come. It was time to test both the heating coil and the motor running at the same time. <sighs> Let's try to debug this thing. So first I just wanted to figure out the behavior. Looks like the motor can run all the way up to full power by itself. But even at the lowest PWM cycle, its power is affected by the lowest duty cycle of the heating element. My first thought in all this was, no way, more current draw problems like we had the last time, but I looked at all the components and they seemed totally rated for which should have been like a half an amp we were drawing. Walking back home, I had the thought that, wait, should I even be PWMing a heating element? Maybe it's some sort of weird artifact from its inductance or something? But then again, the motor has way higher inductance, so that probably isn't it. I thought it would still be nice not to run the heater at such a high frequency though, so I set it and the motor to different clock rates which I can do thanks to not using any delays in my code. Yeah, interesting. It's super clear how only whenever both are on there's a voltage drop. You can see times when they're both on, pulling the 7.2 volt rail down by around 3 volts. So, then I thought maybe I did a horrible job laying out my boost converter. A great thought because I did. After looking at its layout recommendations, I realized mine were highly not ideal. But I couldn't accept that this was the only problem. Because then what? Worst case, I just damaged my boost converter. I replaced it and the same problems happened instantly. After hours of staring at different signals on my oscope though, I came to the most revolutionary of conclusions. It was actually a current draw issue. I don't know why, but when I was doing current calcs for the heating power, I was thinking about it as average power consumption. Meaning on average, the maximum we'd be drawing would be the 350 milliamps at five volts because we would be PWMing it that way. But obviously we're running it at 7.2 volts, so I should have rated it for the half an amp it would actually be drawing. So with that in the motor, and the LEDs, and the microcontroller, that were all powered by the boost converter since the LDO got us the 5 volts from the 7.2 volt rail, we were getting dangerously close to the 800 milliamps our thing could muster. I can't exactly explain this other than just hoping that it really is a combination of overpromising data sheets, poor boost converter efficiency at half an amp, and a bad layout. So my plan to get around this is just to stop running the power hungry heating element off the boost converter. My whole reason for it was because I wanted to use the off the shelf 3D printer cartridge heaters, most of which have a resistance of around 14 ohms but I've seen some 12 volt 40 watt heaters that should have a 3.6 ohm resistance, meaning I would be able to run these directly off the battery and get around the same heat output. Then we'll have a 3.3 volt LDO that's also physically smaller to run just the microcontroller and LEDs. We still need the boost converter for the motor, but this time it won't be powering anything else, so we should be well into safe. With this whole system redesigned though, I decided I might as well add some extra safety features that I was avoiding before, 
because everyone's always telling me I'm gonna get sued launching this thing. First off, I'll add in the battery protection circuitry because I just know that the user is gonna forget to turn this thing off sometimes, which without the right protection will ruin the battery. And the protection circuitry that comes off the batteries makes them thicker and more expensive, so better just have it on board. I then took another look into adding a latching power button instead of a switch because I wanted to be able to turn it off with the microcontroller. But after getting scared by all the extra components and changes I would have to make to the power system, I thought about it harder and realized it's better to have a super reliable switch that can't short, unlike MOSFETs, that I'll always turn the device off. On this next version though, I definitely wanted to add some sort of feedback for heater control to make sure it never gets hot enough to burn someone. A bit back, I mentioned using a thermistor for this, but I kind of hated the idea because I have to somehow get it all the way over to the front of the device, which means more wires and harder assembly. After talking to a friend of mine though, he gave me an interesting idea. Instead of directly measuring the temperature of the heating tip, what if I use the fact that resistance changes as the heating coil gets hotter? We can measure this by measuring the current flowing through the coil. And that you can do by amplifying and measuring the voltage drop over a shunt resistor you put in series with the heater. But the problem with this is that if the coil is made out of nichrome, which I think it is, the change in current is going to be on the order of like 3.8 microamps, which will have a change in the voltage drop of at most 10 millivolts which I'm afraid the ADC will not be able to pick up, since it has a 10-bit resolution, so at best, that's 3.2 millivolts in my case. The air might be huge there, and not enough to distinguish between the borderlines of it burns or not. We'll just have to see. Worst case, if it doesn't work, we could just hard code it, and that'll work just fine for an MVP. I went ahead and laid out my new design. This time, I remembered to follow some design guidelines for the boost converter. And since we're drawing almost twice the current with our new heating element, I had to take care with my trace widths, some of which got pretty big. I also found a new programming pin footprint that takes up way less space, and it self-aligns using a pogo pin cable. Next episode, we'll test out my new design, and hopefully be able to run some tests on the temperature control method. Please pray with me that I didn't make any stupid mistakes. See ya!